Hello, welcome to the 757 Roundtable. This is Vernon Lee, co-founder of the Hampton Roads Youth Foundation, here with my co-founder, Carl Francis Jr. We have an amazing show tonight with a couple of men that have set a standard both in the sports world and faith world. Carl, who we got today? Well, you know what, look, I, I know them very, very well, but I'm going to allow them to do the honors of kind of introducing themselves churches, all the things that they've been doing in their career path. So uh, first I'll start off uh, with my good brother, uh, Pastor Wesley Johnson. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, your, your ministry, your, your church, um, and where you reside and things of that nature, just to get, every, get everybody up to date with where you are today? Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Man, listen, let me just say, it's a pleasure being up here with you brothers, man. This is an esteemed group uh, of brothers. Your track record speak for itself, and so I'm honored to be up here. Uh, as you all know, I'm from the 757, man, born and bred, uh, lived in the D.C. area for uh, about 20 years. Uh, the last decade, we have been in the Northeast, specifically Connecticut. Uh, I've worked for an international Christian youth organization that has had me traveling around the world. Uh, but we decided to settle uh, and we uh, launched a church about four and a half years ago now, the Gathering uh, Christian Church in the greater Danbury community. Uh, our focus is to be Christ in culture. And so how do we uh, make uh, the message of faith real and relevant uh, to those who might be turned off of it? And so we've discovered that people don't have an issue with God, they struggle with religion. And so we've tried to make it practical and relevant in some real and tangible ways, man. And so that's, that's a little bit about who I am. Uh, I was shaped in liberation theology. And so I don't separate my faith from my uh, social engagement. And so it's personal piety and social uh, responsibility. And so we're always looking to engage the least, the lost, the last, and the left out, man. That's just a little bit about who I am and what I do. And we try to keep it real always. Always. Brother Swan, Kevin Swan, my guy. Man, CJ, thank you, man. And Vernon, man, y'all doing great things. And thank you for having me. And uh, Pastor West, it's always good to see you. Uh, sure. Kevin Swan, I'm I've been, I'm a native of Hampton, Virginia, Hampton High Crabber, uh, CJ, <laughs> you're the only one, man. We're going to get you a t-shirt some kind of way, right? No, no I don't want no t-shirt. <laughs> I only want to drive by that school. Hold up, hold up. Oh, that's, 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 that's blasphemy, uh, CJ, but that's all right, man. There you go, Wes. You know what I'm talking about. He in Connecticut and still got a crab. See, that's the faithfulness of the that's crab it. family, right? But, um, you know, grew up playing basketball, uh, actually played behind Pastor Wesley. I had I couldn't get no time because Pastor Wesley was uh, the starting two guard at the high school. Did a great Dr. Job. Swan, Dr. Uh, Swan, I need you to pause and say that real slow. Yeah, you was the starting two guard. I, you, you was ahead of me. I couldn't get no bird. <laughs> so the only, the only time I got birds when you graduated, man. So uh, we're pleased about that. But I uh, finished playing basketball at Old Dominion in college. And then uh, the Lord called me my senior year. Of, of college and um, you know had an opportunity to go overseas and at the same time the, the strong calling on my life to uh, go into ministry and I said Lord you're gonna have to decide for me and so doors began to close another door began to open and went into ministry uh, right after college uh, and then um, started pastoring in 2006 so I've been pastoring for 14 years at Ivy Baptist Church in Newport News Virginia and uh, much of what I do I liken it to sport so I'm, I'm looking forward to this conversation tonight about the intersection of uh, sport and faith. Indeed. Just to, to ground our audience a little bit more, and you both are, are both humble men, at least presently. We know, you know, we know you can brag about some of your exploits, but we do want to kind of set a little bit of a tone in terms of really them understanding which some of the things you guys accomplished um, in the 757 in, in high school. Pastor Johnson, could you, Talk to us a little bit about, you know, what did you experience at Hampton High, football, basketball, a little bit sports-wise, maybe some of the guys you played against. And uh, Pastor Swine, if you could do the same. You know, there's one particular story that we've heard about uh, with a gentleman by the name of Bubba Chuck. We, we want the audience to hear about. So we'll, we'll start with <laughs> Pastor West. Yeah, I would say, man, playing in a 757, specifically and intentionally uh, uh, Hampton High School, uh, you're playing in a, a, a program that is steeped in tradition. Uh, you're playing in a program, man, that is uh, disciplined, uh, that uh, is uh, uh, intentional and is winning. Uh, and so those are some of the principles, man, that have stuck with me today. Uh, I've had the privilege of being able to lead, but it's really uh, the foundation of sports. I believe that sports is a metaphor for life. 
And so playing in a program that's steeped on excellence, that's bent on winning, uh, has served me well. I've had an opportunity to play uh, against some phenomenal guys, man. Too many to name, to be quite honest, man. But uh, it's been a pleasure over the last 20, 30 plus years looking up and watching TV on Sunday or college on a Saturday and being able to see dudes, man, at the next level that you've had the privilege of playing against uh, and battling uh, uh, against and with. And so, uh, it's listen, we play at another level uh, in the 757, man. And so that, that's that been phenomenal for me. I've had an opportunity to play uh, some small college ball uh, in the year and a half that I did play that that level of ball, man. It was, um, uh, it was uh, uh, exciting. Uh, but again, I was able to take the, some of the things that I learned uh, from playing high school ball and being able to translate that into a college level. And one, one quick follow-up, football or basketball, which one was your favorite? That's a hard choice, man. I love both. Uh, I think Bone still contends to this day that uh, CJ, Carl Francis, uh, uh, we're just being real, right? Uh, Carl contends that I probably was a better basketball player than a football player, uh, but I like both equally. Yeah, I, I say he was a better basketball. Football, he was... Uh... I won't come off on him too hard, but uh, he had ability, but he was more natural in basketball. I'll just say it like that, because that's my guy from second grade there. <laughs> well, that's probably a good transition to pass a swine uh, on basketball. It was all basketball for me. I was too skinny to play football, right? But, you know, as for those who may not know about Hampton High, which, uh, you know, the three of us uh, went to school, it's known for football. So it is a is a football factory, at least in the time in which we were raised. I know, Vernon, you got a state championship and all that kind of thing. And so uh, for those who went during our era, that was the expectation. <laughs> you know, it wasn't district. It wasn't regional. It was state championship or bust. And so we came from that kind of environment that Pastor Wesley talked about. Basketball wasn't as known at Hampton High as football. But fortunately for me, uh, we were able to win the state championship also uh, in my senior year. So uh, we actually played against uh, in the semifinals, uh, Grant Hill and South Lakes and, and was able to knock them off. And uh, we were the heavy underdogs and went on to win uh, against Petersburg. Um, and then also with uh, AAU, for those who may be familiar with Boo Williams and his program, I was fortunate enough to be on his first uh, national championship team. And uh, we're talking about playing with guys like Alonzo Mourning and Terry Kirby and Brian Stiff and Milton Bell and some really talented players back then. So, uh, you know, we, we were able to have some measure of success uh, in high school and then go off to play in college. Now, quick follow-up. Now, what's this, it, what's the rumor about a pickup game? Yeah, we got to clear this up. Attended <laughs> or played against something. There's a- We want you to tell it. That's right. Yeah, you know, you know, stories always get yeasted up, man. But I, exactly. I'll tell you how it is, right? So, okay. So for those, yeah, so, you know, around this area, there are a few places where guys go in the area, and this area is a hotbed for talent. And Allen Iverson came out a few years after we did, and we were in the gym one day in the summertime just playing pickup, and um, I, I got the best of him that day. And so he wasn't too too happy about it. And, uh, you know, we didn't play the next day. We played, like, uh, two or three days later. But as I was told, um, he was, he was looking for me the next two days in between the time we went back to the gym. He came back each day waiting for me to be there. And, and then I came back, I think, whatever it was, the third day, and we played again. And then, you know, he got the best of me. So, you know, it was one of them situations where we went back and forth. But, you know, that's Hampton High. I mean, that's, that's Hampton in general. You had great athletes, great talent. And on any, any given day, you could get served up. And that's just, you know, that's just how it was. What the hell? What the hell? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you know, one of the things I, I, I take from this experience that uh, obviously when we were coming up, we really never knew uh, how big of a platform we were involved in at the time, because we were just all of us grew up together went to elementary school, but we didn't know that this this historical platform was being developed by guys like even Bubba Chuck, who came after after us was serving and you know Ronald Curry is Allen I mean we just had so many guys and a lot of guys you hadn't heard of um when, when, when you were if you reflect back to that time uh and you think about your your journeys um what what did you feel what, what did you see going back that you were a part of that, that was really special during those times 
of playing. Like, you know, we into the state championship and you're beating, you're beating yeah. Grand. At the time, Kevin, you you didn't look at it like that. You know, you had, you had, you had Eric Hunter who went on to be a great uh, quarterback in, in college. Um, Wesley, you 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 went on uh, to have a great high school basketball career, playing against some of the best basketball players in, in the state. Who went on to play in the pros? Like, in, in your mindset when you reflect back, how do you uh, kind of view that that time in your life? Hmm. Wow, it's a great question, man. I think you know, and I'm sure Pastor Swan can attest to this, man. Uh, you're living in the moment. Right. Uh, the level of competition that we had the privilege of playing against uh, was normalized. And so we didn't look at it as something uh, uh, exceptional. It's what we did. It's all we knew. Uh, and you're right, man. The, the, after high school, after college, uh, and you look back and you begin to reflect, you're like, wow, we were in a major space, man, playing some high level ball at a young age. Uh, and it's only when you look back in hindsight, uh, are you able to really um, um, uh, see how blessed you were uh, to be able to engage in that level of competition. Uh, and you, you're really able to appreciate it a lot more once you look back. But while we were there, we were in it, man. And that that's what it was. It was just natural. That's what we did. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. And, and to the point of this talent in the region, I mean, you mentioned CJ Ronald Curry. Uh, Ronald Curry played during the time of Michael Vick. And people will tell you that in this area, most people didn't even know who Mike, you know, they knew Mike Vick, but he was overshadowed by Ronald Curry. And so that just goes to show you the level of talent uh, that's in this area. And, and to Pastor West's point, uh, when you're in it, you're just trying to survive it, man. You're just trying to, you know, get from the, and, and I think what we all knew is that whoever would come out of this area had a great chance of having success against other, uh, you know, high schools in the state because this area was so deep. And so, you know, if you're in Hampton, you're worried about Newport News schools and you got to worry about the South Side. And if you are able to survive that, I mean, you felt pretty good that you had a chance of winning it all, man. And so that's what I remember. Just just the camaraderie of the brothers, just the level of competition. Uh, you couldn't take a night off. Uh, you just, you know, you had to bring your A game every single night or you're going to get beat. And uh, that made everybody better. Yeah, yeah. I would say, too, to Pastor Swan's point, the level of competition, uh, when I look at the size uh, of the, the seven cities, the size of the Hampton Roads area, uh, in context to some other larger cities, uh, larger states around the country, uh, man, the concentration of talent is just amazing. Uh, and you don't realize how amazing that talent is, or you don't realize how much other people acknowledge the level of talent in this small concentrated area until you travel abroad and you start talking about sports. And when you start mentioning the 757 or the Hampton Roads area, you're amazed at how many people are aware uh, of the level of talent that is concentrated in this particular area. And so again, man, going back in hindsight, uh, I said, wow, we were fortunate, we were blessed to have the opportunity, man, to be able to play uh, in such a competitive space. Yeah, and, and, and let me add one other piece to that, Pastor West, because uh, to win back then in our era, a state championship was much, much harder than it is now because in this era, you have it divided up by several divisions, yeah. right? So most schools are aligned. You got six divisions, I think. But back then, it was just single A, double A, triple A, right? And, and everybody was mixed in. And so you're playing against schools that may have many more students in it than, than your school, but because you were AAA. So, I mean, the path to get there was, was much greater. So, I mean, you look at that and you compare it to some of the teams today and what we had to go through was much tougher. No doubt about that. So <clears throat> even so following that path about the winning and, you know, young black men wanting to compete, you know, we all come from, you know, I would say pretty strong families and, um, I think our, all of our fathers have influenced us in, in, in quite some way and, and those around us. But I'll be honest with you, know, and again, for those that are watching, we've all known each other for a long time. We grew up together. I can't say that I ever thought that you two would get a call. Like, like it's something I never thought about. Because, you know, these, these are boys or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. Could you talk about what that meant, like, 
you know, because you, your path could have went athletically for both of you, you know, a long way in a, in a maybe in a different direction. But could you talk about what that meant to get that calling to uh, serve God? Wow. Um, Pastor Swan, did you want to you want to speak? Go to ahead, me? man. Yeah, go ahead. You um, that's a great question, man. Uh, I would say to you, man, there was no lightning bolt that came out of the sky. Uh, there was no, no deep story that said all of a sudden I turned my life around kind of a deal. Uh, certainly, um, I, I would say this, I, I have never separated, uh, even at a young age. So, so let me just really kind of go round about. Uh, in second grade, you know her, uh, Ms. Powell <laughs> and uh, Phoenix, uh, Ms. Kelly, uh, Ms. Kelly, fourth grade. Uh, they both, I, my, my mom, God rest my dad's soul, but my mom still has those letters where they said, uh, Wesley, and it's the first time I ever heard this word before in the second grade, Wesley has a propensity towards black history. Uh, and I don't know where that come from. I, I'll chalk it up to the Lord. And so for me, I've never separated my expression of faith uh, from social uh, responsibility. Uh, and so for me, the way we watch football and basketball games and the way we did, uh, I had audio cassette tapes in second and third grade of Dr. King. Uh, and so many of his speeches that were available at that time, I had memorized. And so it would be on my, my dresser Joe, second, third, fourth grade, I would put it in and I would speak with it, uh, right? And so as I begin to mature and think about what it means uh, to be responsible and productive in life and what I wanted to do, sports was always there. But if you ever asked me what I wanted to be or do, I could never really define it. I would just simply say, I want to do what Dr. King did. Uh, and so for me, that, that, that was always something that I felt um, innately and intimately connected with. And as I began to evolve and, you know, we, of course, uh, in the black uh, community, uh, whether you are uh, sold out for your faith or not, it's a cultural expression that you are brought up with. And so for me, uh, the belief in uh, uh, my faith, I've never separated it from uh, who I am. And so for me, it became this natural kind of a, 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 a call to pursue. Uh, so I don't know if there's any lightning that struck, uh, but it just felt naturally that this is the next level uh, of your relationship. This is the next level of your walk. And, uh, and we looked up and I'll be quite honest, I'll say this lastly, I was wrestling with the expression of my faith uh, and my culture as a black man. And I was searching around. The closest thing I had seen, uh, Pastor Swan, uh, uh, was the former uh, pastor of Abbey Baptist. I, I watched him engage in politics and I watched him engage in the local community, but I didn't see that anywhere else for me personally. And it was when I moved to DC, uh, another 757 resident, uh, Reverend Dr. Willie Wilson, uh, made the connection between uh, social responsibility, community, and my faith. And it was at that point, uh, I began to take off and I accepted what we call my call. Yeah, that's awesome, Pastor West. You know, my, my journey is a little bit different and um, was well, a lot different actually. So to start off, I'm an only child. Uh, parents have been married over 50 years. I grew up in a home where my parents did not even worship at the same church. They didn't even worship in the same denomination. My mother was raised Episcopal and my father was raised Baptist. And they told me, listen, you know, you can go, you're going to go to church. You just got to choose which one you want to go to. So I was like, all right, bet. So I went to my mom's church because they used to get out in 45 minutes, right? And I just <laughs> So, so when I was young, you telling me I'm going to church? Oh, I'm going to church. I went to church, right? Uh, and I was involved to some degree in the Episcopal faith. And then I go off to college and I meet my now wife who was raised Kojic. Now, can you imagine, uh, for those who don't know, Church of God in Christ, which is very charismatic, Pentecostal, and you have an Episcopal boy, which is very reserved. And, and so, you know, we're trying to find this happy space of how we're going to move forward in our faith together because she wasn't feeling where I was. And I, I honestly didn't understand a lot of the things of which she grew up in in her church experience. And so we ended up at a Baptist church. Now, at the time when, as I said earlier, I got the call to, to ministry, honestly speaking, that wasn't a part of our plan. Again, the part of our plan was to go overseas, to get an agent, maybe live in Charlotte or DC or Atlanta. Even if that didn't work out, it was never to stay uh, here in Newport News. And again, one confirmation after the other, after the other, God made it abundantly clear, this is what I want you to do. Now, that wasn't for me. Uh, it took me a minute to, to, to accept that. Because again, when I first met my, my wife at the time, 
we had different aspirations. But looking back on it now, I'm grateful that those doors closed uh, and I'm where I am today because I am able to have impact just in a different way. Mm. Can I, can I, there's some similarities there, Pastor Swan. Um, uh, God rest my father's soul who was laid to rest at uh, Ivy uh, mm -hmm. under your leadership. And we're so grateful for that. Um, as you know, my, my pops was Baptist, right? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and in 40 plus years uh, before my dad passed, uh, my mom is still a staunch Pentecostal. And so growing up, uh, they were never, they were in two different denominations and uh, we did the same thing. We, we kind of chose what we thought was most convenient for us at an early age in terms of whether it would be Baptist or uh, Pentecostal expression. And so for sure, man, I, I know what that's like as a kid. I'm going to church with mama today. I think I'm gonna go to church uh, with daddy. Yeah, for sure. It's two different theologies because, you know, yeah. denominations have very different views, right? And so uh, Pastor West, the joy for me was seeing my parents when I went into ministry that they decided to join the church of which I was mm -hmm. I, at the time was a, the first time in my life I'm in my 20s that I now see my mother and father going to church wow. together that's beautiful you know, so uh, you know some people have different experiences about all of that but I didn't and, yeah. and all of my calling came later it, it wasn't for me you're going to know since birth Right. that this is what you're supposed to yeah, be about. Yeah, yeah, So I, I would, we could talk offline, Pastor Swan, I would, but, but, but my wife was, uh, my wife was uh, a Seventh-day Adventist. Yeah. Me growing up between Baptist and Pentecostal, uh, very different theological constructs, mm -hmm. uh, very different hermeneutic, man. And uh, she was steep. That's what she was raised in. Uh, and so we had to make a decision on where we would worship together because I was clear, no disrespect, but I just, it didn't fit. Uh, and so we had to make a decision on where uh, we were going to worship uh, as we were pursuing uh, our relationship together. Big up Vern for the, uh, making that connection. <laughs> One of the things I think is unique about both of you guys is that, um, you know, we live in a world now where, you know, being an athlete is not a simple process. And obviously there are some similarities and all of us have been in locker rooms. We prayed before games, prayed after games and, and looking at, um, you know, Kevin, I'm kind of familiar of some, I'm familiar with some of your services, such as Jersey Sundays, you know, you're a staunch Steelers fan, right? And how you, you really sometimes, uh, <laughs> there you go, Vernon. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and, I was going to bring my terrible towel to this, man, but I was like, no, nah, I'm going to hold off tonight. <laughs> you should have. You should have. You know, represent Mike T. And, yeah. uh, you know, and, and, and when you look at some of your ministry is, is geared around using phrases in basketball or in sports. That's your connection. Same with you, uh, uh, you know, Brother Johnson, just uh, with your approach uh, to ministry, laid back casual, and your ability to connect with youth and young people. Kevin, I, you know, look, you you know how I thought about you when, when my son was was going through a little transition and I thought about you because you was in, the, you know, you played in the same conference and, you know, people don't know that just because young people play sports, it don't mean they don't have issues. And, and even if they're having success. Right. And I, I think what's interesting about uh, both of you guys is having the ability to, uh, make that translation to bring in, as Vernon mentioned, faith and sports together to give a person a perspective or a voice or a direction. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's funny because my son had a call this morning uh, with the entire A-10 conference and basketball players mm -hmm. with the minister. Mm -hmm. that, that's actually from, from D.C. I know him. I mean, he's from Northern Virginia. But I'm just thinking, let me think about that. The entire A-10 met with a minister this morning mm -hmm you know, to discuss what have you, but how do, you know, and also you, you, you ministered at uh, our camp a few years ago, which I thought that was a tremendous, you know, conversation you had with our campers about um, the example you used, which you were a young man and you made the decision that you didn't want to dig ditches, no disrespect to people who did that. Right. But you want, you didn't want to do that. You chose a different path. You know, looking at that ability to bring that connection, give, give me your thoughts to your theories about helping young people uh, using sport analogies or sports theories that you may know uh, to get young people over adversity or, or through tough times. 
Well, CJ, you know, for most people, especially young people, there are two hooks, as we call it, things that can really grab the attention of young people, and that's music and sports. And, and for me, uh, sports is really all I know. Uh, I was raised in it. And when I went into ministry, that was one of the first things that hurdles that I had to figure out, right? I'm a ball player. That's what I grew up doing. How can I make this transition into ministry so that it makes sense for me so that then I can deliver it and it makes sense for others. And there were two verses uh, in scripture that really helped me to do that. Uh, the first one is in Matthew four and it's where Jesus is uh, approaching his disciples, the people that he's choosing to be with him. And he says to them, uh, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And what's interesting about that verse is that they were already fishermen. Mm. So what stuck with me was uh, what Jesus is saying to the disciples is, look, you can follow me. And all I'm going to do is to teach you what you already know, but to shift it, to do it for how I need you to do it. Mm. So when I got that, that liberated me because now I don't feel like I have to be like someone else because not only did I come from a divergent background, but there's nobody in my family right now, even today, that's a pastor. There's nobody in my family that's a minister. There's not even nobody in my family that's a deacon. So I didn't have the background of seeing that. So the only thing that I know is sport. Mm. And, and the second verse that helped me uh, was 1 Corinthians 9, 24. And, and the apostle Paul says there, in a race, all the runners run, uh, but only one gets the prize. So run in such a way that you plan to win, right? Mm. And I looked at that verse and I said, you know what? Nobody enters a race without first preparing themselves. You have to train, you have to get your mind right. And then when you get in a race, you have to run it in such a way that you expect to win. So I'm seeing all of these uh, sport analogies and metaphors in the Bible. And now I'm like, okay, okay. I finally see how I can weave my experience. So if you were to ask me today, uh, I would still tell you, CJ, that I'm a coach, but I'm not a coach on a basketball court. Yeah. I'm a yeah. coach helping people in life. We got a playbook. There's plays to be run. Yeah. You have a team. You have an opponent. You have to scout the opponent. Yeah. You can't win unless you run the plays. Yeah. And so you have to put the work in individually and collectively. So when I started to line up what I already knew, and line it up with what God was calling me to do. That's when the light bulb went on for me. Mm. And now I'm really free to be me. Mm. Uh, I'm, I'm just me. You can call me pastor. I know some people have so many images of what a pastor should be. Mm. But if you were to ask me, I'm just a coach. Yeah, and I'm just doing it on a different playing field. That's it. That's it. Well stated, bro. Well stated. Well stated. Uh, similar, man. Uh, I don't sing. I don't play an instrument, right? right. So, so uh, my connection to my faith is my sports, right? Uh, and so that, that's what it is for me. And, and there, there's an unapologetic passion uh, specifically and uniquely for young people, but intentionally black males. I am unapologetic and I am unrelenting about that. And so one of the easiest ways to make a connection uh, with that particular population is through the vehicle of sports. Uh, and because it's what I know is natural. Uh, and so, yeah, the whole Jersey Sunday piece and all of that. And then here's the biggest part. Each one of us, whether you are a pastor or a minister or, or whether you are just uh, uh, what you ascribe to the tenets of the faith, uh, all of us have a particular bent and a unique anointing. Uh, and for me, uh, growing up as the eldest of three, uh, I wrestled with self-worth. I wrestled with my value. I wrestled with my esteem. Am I good enough? And you all know my brothers and there's some wild dudes, man. But academically, they were gifted. Uh, and I worked like heck. Uh, to get that good COB. Uh, and so you're the eldest in age, but in size, you're the smallest. Uh, and academically, you're struggling. Uh, and so for me, man, self-worth was important. And so for me, as we talk about kind of life versus Ephesians 2 is 10, that we are, you know, uh, I'm God's masterpiece created in the image of Christ Jesus, uh, where he has already preordained for me to do good works. And so for me, when I'm coming at young people, I'm affirming the reality of who they are before they were ever born. Uh, and then another piece, uh, 1 Corinthians 9, 24, which Pastor Swan alluded to, uh, realizing that we're in a race. And I have it right here. Don't you realize that you're in a race? Everyone runs, but only one gets the prize. So run 
in such a way to win. And part of the way I minister is a way that I was uh, trained in track. Uh, uh, East Hampton Striders, shout out to the East Hampton Striders in Virginia. What up, Knight? Uh, and so, uh, so one of the things that Coach Ronald taught us uh, early on in sixth and seventh grade, he said a, what a race can be won or lost on the curve. He said, depending on how you run the curve would determine what your straightaway looks like. And so for me, that, that's what it is. And so I'm trying to teach, man, how you run the curves of life how you deal with the ups and downs, how you deal with the struggles, how you deal with the inconsistencies, because how you navigate that curve, when you come off, you're looking at a straightaway in life. And, and so for me, th those are the two scriptures I think that help to shape how I minister. And so I'm unapologetic. Uh, you can probably count on one hand the amount of times I've worn a suit. I got some dope ones, uh, but I much prefer to, prefer to put a baseball cap on, man, and a hoodie, because I believe that's naturally how I'm wired and how I'm gifted. And so, uh, man, that, that's that's how I do. And I think that's important to be able to make that connection uh, with the audience that you are targeting. That's a good, <clears throat> uh, first of all, again, it's always something, we're, look, we, we're all friends, we've known each other, but again, the, the ongoing ministry and the sharing is something I think is special, and especially, I think, for those that are watching. And when you talk about being coaches and, and sort of your natural selves I mean it's clear we're, we're in some you know absolutely unprecedented times we're in a global pandemic we're dealing with social unrest and uh, lack of justice across a, a number of areas and things that are continuing to come to light and both systematically and, and otherwise how do you balance maybe some of your natural instincts as black men with faith do you separate them is it always together do you have, are you constantly tooling like a coach to balance those things out because uh, obviously especially with <clears throat> mental health and, and depression and anxiety that uh, your followers and friends and family members are, are coming to you with uh, how do you balance that how are you how do you find that balance or is it hard to find that balance wow pastor west you want to start with that yeah i would say um i would say let me just say this first um uh, i think balance is something that we should strive for but I think it's an elusive chase. And so I think we try to build our lives around healthy rhythms, kind of understanding the season and the time. And so I would say with that, particularly as a pastor who you're often wearing a multiple uh, number of hats, uh, I'll defer to Pastor Paul, uh, uh, Apostle Paul, who actually theologically I wrestle with. Uh, if we're talking about mental health, I think Paul theologically was one who was uh, running from his past. And I think it reflected in his writings. Right, I think he tried to over. That's a whole other theological conversation. I think he <laughs> some things, um, but he did say this, and it stuck with me. Um, that he says, "I, I, um, I become all things uh, uh, to all people, that I might win some." And so, I think as a pastor, we wear multiple hats. How we wear them is really important. Uh, we have to wear them with wisdom. I think we have to wear them with authenticity. Uh, I think we have to wear them with a certain level of vulnerability and transparency. Uh, and I think I said earlier, uh, I, I think biblical justice, you can't have any uh, peace without justice. Uh, and the word, the, the Greek word that translates uh, for justice is righteousness and vice versa. Uh, and so two, I think the two are intimately connected. And so I think particularly as pastors of color, uh, we have a historical responsibility uh, to make sure that we're speaking for the vulnerable uh, particularly in the historical context that we find ourselves in, in the United States. I think we would be doing a disservice uh, to the prophetic unction that all of us have uh, at varying degrees, but particularly if you are a pastor of color, there's just another kind of pr prophetic uh, uh, call that's on your life to address the unique circumstances that we found ourselves uh, here in the United States. And so, yes, it is a balance. Uh, uh, it is uh, uh, art and a science. Uh, but it's something that you have to do prayerfully, uh, but you have to do it. There's no question. And Pastor West is 1,000% correct. There's a unique experience uh, in the African-American context here in the United States. And, and what I try to do is also, again, put it in the context of sport. So when you play organized sports, you also are playing within a prescribed system uh, of which the coach is going to run. So CJ, you played football. So in defense, you might've played a three, four, you might've played a four, three. That's the system of which uh, was been subscribed for you. And any player, any athlete knows that that's the difference between playing street ball and playing in organized sports is the system that mm -hmm. has been set up by the coach. 
if you take that illustration and look at the history of our country, then what we would discover is that the systems that have been established since African-Americans arrived here in the United States uh, in 1619, right here in Fort Monroe of Hampton, mm -hmm. the systems have not benefited black people. And we were brought here as commodities. We were not brought here as being seen equal. Mm -hmm. We were brought to be uh, ones to take care and make money for the slave masters. And we know this to be true because even after we got here and there was issues about slavery, when they decided how were they gonna view black people, this is our government, how are they gonna look at black people when it comes to representation? The government decided that we would be considered three fifths of a human being. Mm -hmm. That's the system. And this is what we have to uh, let our young people understand because they only see the Breonna Taylor. That's like the grass. You gotta see the root cause. Mm -hmm. If you just cut off the tops of the grass, you know what's gonna happen. The grass is gonna grow again. Mm -hmm. The root causes of the, of the problems of black people in our country is systems that have been set up that are still in place that oppress black people. And until we get to that place, we'll continue to have these conversations and there will continue to be challenges. But in each generation, there is progress, but the progress has to be in dismantling the systems that exist and recreating new ones. Can, can, and, I, and I would say, I, I love that analogy, uh, the sports analogy, because we're, we're, co we're connecting sports and faith. And I would even say, if we're looking at uh, the NFL now and the emergence of the black quarterback, uh, uh, they're changing the way the game is being played, uh, the ability to throw and run, not an either or, but a both and. And Lamar Jackson has flipped the game upside down uh, with his creativity and his excitement. And I would say the same theologically. Uh, I, I would say to your point, past, uh, Pastor Swan, uh, we have to challenge uh, the theological construct. We have to challenge the hermeneutics, which is the interpretation of what it is that we're reading, uh, because uh, we have been playing from a, we have been using a playbook that has not benefited us, uh, what, right? It's the same sport. It's the same faith. It's the same gospel. Uh, but the playbook has not benefited our style of play. And so our theology and our hermeneutic has to be adjusted. Pastor Johnson. Pastor West, I think we uh Yeah, he may have froze a little bit. He back on, he back, he's back on. Yes, you're back. Yeah, I think he froze again. Yeah, he froze. Yeah, if, uh, maybe I can just jump in uh, mm -hmm. until he gets yeah. back on. Uh, what he's saying is, obviously, we have to challenge what has been in place for us. Now, uh, to that end, let me go back. This is also why it's necessary to vote. Because voting, uh, when you vote, you're voting for people who either are supporting the system that is against you, or trying to recreate a system that better works in your favor. And when you look at the United States and when you look at every single construct in the United States, black people are at a disadvantage. COVID, for example, COVID is impacting the African-American community three times higher than it is any other ethnic group. Now, why is that the case? It's the case simply because African-Americans have a lack of access to adequate health care. And right now there's legislation to try to take away the Affordable Care Act, i.e. Obamacare, that help black people to get the kind of health care that they need. So if you're gonna take that away, again, you put us at a disadvantage where our people cannot get the kind of health care and we will continue to see the disparities that exist between blacks and others. That's just one area. Mm -hmm. Go to the legal system. Why is it that again, there's two different sentencings that used to be in place. One for powder cocaine, and one for crack cocaine. I don't have to tell you who, do, who does crack and who does powder cocaine, but powder co cocaine, you got a lesser sentence than you did if you got crack cocaine. Why is that? This is the systems that are in place. Why do we have private prisons in America? If you have a private prison, that means you are running a business. And if you're running a business, then that means somebody 
has to be your customer. And if you have customers, where are you getting the customers from? The judges that sentence more black people to go to jail than any other ethnic group. These are the, these are the systems, again, that have not benefited and worked in our favor. And I know, Pastor West, you're back now, so you can go ahead and uh, uh, chime back in, man. Take yourself off mute. Mute. Mercy. I'm struggling here, brothers, but I, I, I think you said it well, Pastor Swan. I just think, again, uh, I, the way we approach things theologically as pastors of color uh, has to be intentional and unapologetically unique. Uh, again, you, I heard you talking about voting, uh, and it is more critical than ever. I'm not going to tell you how to cast your vote or who to cast your vote with, but, but what is important is that you are an active participant in this system. Uh, and those of us who've had the, the privilege and the honor of playing sports and being able to relate uh, in a very practical and relevant way, we have the responsibility to leverage our platform to be able to address some obvious historical uh, structural and systemic issues that continue to plague us. And we have to be unapologetic about that. I know uh, 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 Vern uh, is in a great house, uh, Pastor Swan, that you are aware of. Vern is in, in a great house uh, that is unapologetically addressing uh, our, how our faith uh, intersects uh, with the realities of where we find ourselves in today. And so again, I think we have to do that. And so we get the privilege of looking at the playbook and saying, you know what, that play, those plays haven't been working for us. And so we're going to either toss that playbook or we're going to take them and we're going to rework them so that it's beneficial for our team. Now, I, I, I have two questions. So on, on that note, what would you tell the young athlete who may have a sense, a high sense of spirituality within him, uh, but is met with some resistance, some resistance, some embarrassment on expressing his faith. And mm -hmm. as a, he may be the star, he may be the last guy on the team that's for any sport, uh, male or female. Uh, number one, what advice, high school or even college? Because it's like you, Pastor Swan, they may have a calling, but don't know how to express it. Mm -hmm. um, what advice would you give that young man or yet young lady who uh, may have a strong sense of spirituality within them who would love to uh, be a voice uh, for his calling, um, but is somewhat ashamed or a little nervous. And two, lastly, what is your message to the young athlete, okay, uh, who holds the responsibility of using Pastor Johnson, as you said, your platform, because whether you play, whether you're a star on a team or what have you, when you are a part of a team, right? Whether you're the first person off the bench or started or been, when you have a, when you play sports, you are part of something special and you have a certain platform uh, to use. What advice will you give a young person uh, moving forward in terms of how he carries himself and, and his responsibility in, in society? Mm -hmm. Pastor West. I would say, um, did I freeze, gentlemen? You okay? Good. Okay. Yep. I would say, I would say, gentlemen. I feel like I'm freezing. Um, my apologies, man. It's out of my control. You all right? I, did I freeze again? Mm -mm. No. Keep going. Keep okay. Going. I'll let you know. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I would say, um, uh, yes, uh, you have a responsibility with the platform that you've been given. I think that's number one. Whether you are a starter or whether you're uh, whether you're coming off. The bench last. Uh, but, but secondly, I would say um, just look at history. Uh, Hebrews talks about a, a great cloud of witnesses that have gone before us. And so you, you are not the first one struggling with your faith, the expression of your faith, your spirituality, and your platform. Look at those who've gone before you. Look at Steph Curry, look at Russell Wilson, look at Cam Chancellor, look at Maya Moore, look at Kyle Korber, look at Gabby Douglas, look at Allison Felix, look at Mahmoud Abdul Raouf, look at Hakeem Olajuwon, look at, we can go on and on and on. There's a great cloud of witnesses that have gone before you. Look at them. There's some organizations, some faith-based organizations uh, uh, that are targeted towards athletes. Leverage those uh, platforms and tools uh, to your disposal and to your benefit. And so you don't have to go at it alone because there's been a script that's already been outlined. So I would say leverage those things. The other thing I would say, if you are a parent and you are, and you have a child that's young, 
uh, I would say now is the time to begin to help them understand just how important spirituality and their faith is. Uh, my son, who you all know, who's, who's playing college ball now, Division One, and we're so thankful for the uh, for the full ride. Uh, but when he was playing Pop Warner, uh, we were very clear with his coaches. Uh, we were very clear with his coaches, and I wanted to make sure with, my, with my, the youngest son and all of my sons, and even my daughter, uh, that we go to church first. And even being an associate minister, assistant pastor, I would say my son has my sons have a game today, uh, so I won't be on the pulpit. But my son would come to church half dressed, and uh, at the offering or whatever the time it was, we would leave and make the game in time because I always wanted him to realize that his faith and spirituality were a priority. And so I think if you have young parents, how do you begin to, to teach that now as a priority uh, for your kids? So when they get on a college campus, they're not ashamed or afraid of their expression of faith. Uh, but, but I would say there, there are people who've gone before you uh, leverage those resources and those models. Yeah, that's 100% correct, Pastor West. And I can just answer this question from a personal narrative. CJ, uh, our son is 16. He's a junior at Hampton High. He's playing basketball. And at the same time, he is discovering for himself. We didn't push it on him, uh, but we wanted to give him the opportunity to really discover uh, God on his own terms. And, and he's starting to do that. Now, he already has to deal with the fact that they know that he's a preacher's kid, right? <laughs> so part of it is, is you growing into and being comfortable with who you are. And that could be anything. That's not just religion. And it's especially difficult because at that age and in, in, in uh, counselors and psychologists say this to be true, that your formation of self at an early age is not necessarily defined by you. It is more defined by how others around you think of you. So this is why going back to the village that we used to have in our communities, why the village is so important. And if I were to say the biggest thing that has happened to the black community is that we've lost the village. Mm -hmm. So that the collective voices of people that can tell our young people you don't need to be doing that. Like in our neighborhoods, when we grew up, y'all know, everybody down the street was your parents. By the time I got home when I did something wrong, uh, five neighbors would have already called my parents and told them what I did yeah. mm -hmm. because there was a collective effort. And when mm -hmm. we lost that, mm -hmm. now kids are trying to figure it out on their own and they don't have enough voices to tell them, that's not who you are. That's, that's, right. that's not what you spoke. You, you're better than that. You, that's you, right. you know who you, and so, I think that's the struggle for young people now um, that we have to have more support systems for them to encourage them to walk in the purposes that God has assigned. Mm -hmm. and, and the last piece I would say is what advice would I give? It's great being an athlete, but an athlete is what athletics is what you do. Athletics is not who you are. Mm -hmm. So, so let's begin to separate the two. You can shoot a basketball, you can play football and you may be able to do that well, but that's what you do. And all of us who's played sport, we know that if we're not careful, people will simply identify us by just that one thing. But there's more to life to you than what you do on a football field. There's more to life to you than what you do on a basketball court. And oftentimes we never get to that question with people because we're so enamored with them and what they do. So we really want to spend some time with kids. And if somebody, young person is listening, spend more time also thinking about who you are. Mm. If yeah, COVID, COVID has been a wonderful example yeah. of what would happen if you couldn't play sport because sport yeah, right. was taken away for a period of time. That's right. That's right. Who, are you, who are you now? Who are you? Who are you? What, what are you doing now? What, what's your purpose? Yeah. 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 And, and because we have driven the message that you got to work and, and you can only be successful by being an athlete or an entertainer in our, in our community, a lot of our kids struggle with identity. Oh, and, and, and this is the perfect time now to get them back to, that's what you do, but that's not who you are. Who you are. Pa pa Pastor Strong, you said it. Uh, Pastor, I keep saying, Pastor Swan, because you are saying some strong stuff. Pastor Swan, uh, I, I would say, man, uh, in terms of personalizing, and you guys know, so, so Vern and, 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 and uh, CJ knows, uh, I leaned on them heavily uh, about a year and a half ago, two years ago, because my son was in a crisis of faith, right? He, he was in a crisis uh, as an African-American male who has always been a star and found himself in a very awkward and precarious position and trying to figure this thing out because all he had done 
was identified as an athlete. Doors opened because of his athleticism. Popularity and fame opened because of his athleticism. And now he find, found himself in a tough space and he couldn't lean on that anymore. And so for a few months there, man, it was a rough go because he was acting out a character because he had become, he had started relying on his identity as an athlete. Uh, he hadn't been able to separate the two, uh, but man, wow. And I'm looking at, a, at an 18 year old now, soon to be 19, uh, who kind of rediscovered who he is and, and uh, as opposed to what he does. Uh, and so while he is away, I know like clockwork, one of the people that's going to be online watching when we go online on service is him, not because that's my pops online, but because he's connecting intentionally with his faith and that grounds him. When he says to me, I'm connected to some, 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 some faith organizations on campus, it's not because of me, it's because he's made an intentional choice because he's owned that. And so now there's this thing of, uh, I'm going to rock this scholarship, uh, but by the time I'm a senior, I'm going to be working on my grad and they're going to be paying for it. Just a different mentality uh, of this is what I do. And this is who I am, man. And so I think I think you're spot on, Pastor Swan. This is a great opportunity for young men and women, particularly of color, uh, to re-examine what they do, juxtaposed to who they are. Well, yes, and, I, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I'm saying this from real experience. You, you talk about you know sharing our moments. It yeah. took me at least two years, and and part of why my calling was delayed in some cases and I wasn't feeling it initially was because so much of my life and my identity hmm. was vested in my persona of being an athlete. And for those of us, all of us who play that last game, whether you win the championship or you lose, it's over just like that, right? And now all of a sudden, everything that you've been taught, you gotta work hard, you gotta put work in, you gotta be better, all of that now you have to shift. And so it took me two years to figure out who am I now that I'm not playing basketball anymore. Yeah. And what I discovered was God was telling me that wasn't your path. Your path was to learn the lessons of sport, mm -hmm. to then take what you've learned and apply it to your life and then share it with others. And once I caught that, then all of the sports, all of the, all of the accomplishments, all of that began to make more sense as opposed to why am I not playing anymore? Yeah. So yeah, all of this type kind of ties in because to the young person who's still out there, go chase your dream. You know, if you, if you think you can make it to a college campus, go ahead and pursue your dream. But as I tell my son, at some point in your life, whether it's sooner or later, the ball is gonna stop dribbling mm -hmm. and you're gonna have to figure out what you're gonna do next. And mm -hmm. that's where it really helps mm -hmm. you now. I wish somebody told me this about, think about who you are. <laughs> Think about yeah. you. Sure. Now we are. Uh, we'll see. I mean, we covered some real good stuff tonight. Uh, this was just really amazing. Uh, you know, Pastor Wesley uh, was referring to my house earlier. For those watching, not where I live, house, but where I worship at Alfred Street. Yeah. Um, which I've been very blessed with, Pastor Howard John Wesley and yeah. Pastor yeah. Kevin Swan's been up there and been in the yeah. pool yeah. and it was great yeah. for them and and for the and. Past what I mean, we talk a lot. So the one thing I as we're as we wrap up here, we talked a lot about the youth, but I will tell you, both of you have been inspirations to me. We've had again offline conversations as friends, but uh, my ability to to look at you as leaders in the community and uh, of your houses of worship, and also as, as family men, continue to give me. I mean, we all got to lean on each other. For those watching, I just want them to know that we're not doing it individually just on our own. We all are relying on each other for different things to, to make it through. You know, in the business world, I'm dealing with a lot of different things. So I just want to say I appreciate both of you. And, you know, when I reach out time to time and, you know, and I might need a little extra prayer every now and then. But uh, so I just want to make sure I publicly said uh, stated that before we wrap things up here. You know what, Vern, let me get mine in too, because I feel the same way. And that's a serious business because, uh, you know, I was in, I'm going to be honest with you. This is a true story, man. I, I was in Las Vegas. It was like 10 o'clock at night and I had a situation with my son and we had a, we, we had a real emotional conversation, but it was, it was positive. And Dre, I definitely would have called you, but I thought about Swan because, you know, he, he he played basketball in college 
and he had a good career. Mm -hmm. He played in that conference, and, mm -hmm. and I felt a little bad at mm -hmm. first. Like, man, I haven't talked to I haven't talked to Swan in like three or four years. <laughs> but something kind of came over me, like, but Swan, we're connected. So regardless of whether I talked to him in five years or ten years, I always felt as though mm -hmm. if I needed you, I'm gonna I'm gonna call you. And I relied on that on that faith. And it was like the the thing that's awesome about both of you brothers is you know you got a lot of lot of programs initiatives at church um you know ministries that you manage and oversee but there has never been a time where i've texted or called and you have never picked up you, you've always picked up the phone and then that night i really needed you right and you mm. picked up the phone and gave me something swan and and then i had then i hadn't talked to you again until i saw your odu but it was like because you know we got a lot of stuff going on we racing but you jump right in and i appreciate that and that's and I, so I want to let you guys know that I don't take that for granted, uh, being friends of you guys, but because Vernon said we all got a lot of things going on, but I know what if, if I'm in a deep, dark hole and I may need some support, that's the beauty of this, of this friendship, watching you guys grow into your roles and, and, and pillars in the community that we can pick up a phone and we can text and boom, you'll be right on it. So I just wanted to get that out before you close out, Vernon, but go ahead and continue my phone. Yeah, I would say if uh, Vern, I just want to say I want to return the favor. I want to ret return the many thanks uh, to you all as well. Uh, over the years, man, you guys have uh, all of you all have been consistent. You've been faithful uh, in the relationship to me, and I don't take it for granted. Uh, my circle is high and tight, man, like a fade, and it's intentionally so. While I might know a lot of people, my circle is high and tight, like that good fade, and you guys are a part of that circle. Uh, I probably talked to uh, Vern and uh, CJ, you guys a little more. Uh, but again, with Pastor Swan, man, there's never a text uh, that I send to Pastor Swan uh, where I don't get a response back, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oftentimes, and I, if I find, find myself in Hampton visiting family, checking on my mom, uh, there's been times I've been able to stop by uh, Ivy, man, and uh, be able to chop it up with Pastor Swan. And so those little things, man, uh, mean so much. It's like any relationship, man. You don't really remember the big things. Uh, it's the little things that really uh, sustain and carry the relationship, man. And so you guys have been incredibly uh, 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 beneficial to me and my relationships uh, in, in, in very different ways, man. Uh, Pastor Swan, when my father passed, we all had our, and have our fathers in our lives. I had mine, uh, but man, you guys know what that relationship is like, man, with your pops uh, and to have to lose mine uh, and to have uh, 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 Pastor Swan be there for me when my mm. pops died. Uh, mm. Sit at 613 Greenlawn uh, when my pops died uh, and then allowed me access to his pulpit uh, to, to give the message, bro, that's huge, right? That ain't to be taken for granted. Uh, and Vern, I ain't married 26 years, Pop, uh, if you didn't make the introduction, right? <laughs> if you didn't make the introduction, I ain't married 26 years. And I'm saying the bone in that, in that crisis of faith, uh, uh, knowing your role, uh, you, you called my son uh, without me knowing, huge. When he finally accepted his scholarship, you not knowing, you called that morning when I was dropping him off to school and he was in the car. And so he had an opportunity to hear your voice uh, directly. And so I don't know if it's by accident that he's majoring in broadcast uh, journalism. It, it, I don't know what the relationship with that is. And so it's just huge, man. I appreciate all you brothers and uh, who you are and what you will continue to be. This has been fantastic. Man, I love y'all, man. You know, we go That's so far love. back. And, and listen, you know, my phone will always be open to you guys, and, and I think Pastor West, I can speak for you when I say this. For those who are watching who may not really understand church, uh, we as pastors are not in the church business. We're in the relationship business. Mm. That's that's what we're called to be. Uh, first with God and then with each other. So if I don't answer that phone, if I'm not there to support my brother, I'm not being a good teammate. Mm -hmm. That's not developing a good relationship. And mm -hmm. So our greatest witness is that not how we shout and dance and what we do and how we dress, mm. but it's how we help each other uh, in moments of crisis and uncertainty mm. and helping each other move forward. So I'm just honored that you all think of, enough of me to call me or that you can come to me in those times. And I know if I have a moment, I can come to y'all. And that's what life is all about, man. So Absolutely. love y'all, man. Keep doing the big work that you're doing, all of you. No doubt. No Best doubt. luck to y'all. We'll end it with that. We appreciate you. All appreciate right. you, my brother. Y'all be